Hi. Morning. You've braved a snowstorm to come here. So I love you that much more for that. <laughs> Today, as previously announced, we are going to continue in our reading of the first chapter in Ariel Rubin's The Princessa. And what we are doing, keep in mind, serves the purpose of introducing the kind of analysis that you will be doing yourself. Hopefully you'll master the methodology by the end of the semester for your final paper. And in fact, I will stop at some point, probably I will not get to the very end of the excerpts that I assigned from this book because I want to spend some time talking about how to write the paper, what an effective, successful template would be for the paper, examine to you, with you, the examples that you find in this page called ideas and suggestions for the paper. Of course, that will not be the only time we talk about the paper, but this would be a good time to introduce that. And also because depending on the book you choose to work on from the list that you find on that page, you may need some time to find it in a library or to order it from an online used books company such as A Books or to order it from Amazon, etc. Okay? On Friday, as previously announced, the movie will be the talented Mr. Ripley. I will continue to use the PDF of the excerpts from the Princessa. And this is more or less where we got to around page five of the book. The page numbers in square brackets are from the book itself. And I have underlined and marked some passages that serve the purpose of showing how Machiavellian or how distant from Machiavellianism the statements, the ideas in the book are. Uh, so, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Yeah. as it happens with a lot of these books, which are both an attempt to revive, revisit, and repropose, repackage the idea of Machiavelli, and also are trying to present themselves within the broader category of self-help books. They will have at one point or another, or multiple times throughout their pages, to these about the ideas of Machiavelli about the use of force and aggression. And this is what you find in here as well, right? You, the reader, will learn, and learn is the key word that tells you that this is being proposed to you as a self help book the means by which you can get what you want, which would be obtaining the outcome in Machiavellian terms, not by assertiveness or aggression, because of course, one aggression is out of the question in our society. The other assertiveness is, uh, has become tainted. And if this was 1997, although I used the 1998 reprint of the book, you can imagine by now uh, what, what the, how things stand in regards to that concept or behavior. Not by raising your voice or a fist, which is coupled with raising your voice, assertiveness, a fit, raising your fist with aggression, not by brutal means or by becoming a presence of great authority, and those are criticism of Machiavelli, this is not acceptable in our civilized society. You will learn that winning involves 
take it for yourself and then it goes into concepts that you can call neo-feminists and also alternatives and a lot of the book especially the second part of the book is devoted to alternatives to any kind of aggressive let alone violent behavior and uh, finding more peaceful approaches. You find in this chapter the concept of leadership associated with the modern concept of enabling, that is to say, leadership doesn't mean you go ahead and people follow, but you lead from the back. You lead by enabling those around you to become active players, okay? So you're not ahead of the group, leading the group, you're in the back, supporting the group and following their leadership in a supportive way, right? It's interesting what you find here as the first law, but then it's like law number zero because the numbering starts at the actual numbering uh, to the side of these laws in italics restarts at one uh, i don't know uh, good copy editing is a lost art i guess but what is here declared to be the first law is to become a woman who combines opposites and i like this idea you can do something with it in reference to Machiavelli. Because midway through The Prince especially, there are a series of interesting chapters, one in particular, where Machiavelli will insist on opposites applied to the models for leadership. And he goes through a series of adjectives and then a short series of historical examples saying, you can win by being good, you can win by being cruel as a leader, for example. And he makes the examples, the opposite examples of Hannibal Barca, a famous Carthaginian leader who almost brought the Roman Republic to its knees and was finally defeated by them. And the Roman general Scipio on the other side of the battlefield, who was more uh, of the kind of a paternal leader to his soldiers and supporters. And Machiavelli say you can win with either attitude. And he goes through a series of opposite examples. You can, you can be a successful leader by being generous, and you can be uh, a successful leader by being uh, more, more uh, parsimonious, etc. Because in the end, it's never about the quality, the practice, the behavior, the attitude. Rather, it's all about how that attitude, quality, or behavior, what effects it will have once deployed in a context or ecosystem. Namely, the fact that the context, the circumstances in which leadership is exercised will dictate whether that will be successful or not. So it's all about matching attitudes, qualities, personalities with the issues that need to be resolved in a particular context. And depending on the context, the skills you have to bring to the table as an individual may be a good match or a mismatch. So it's not about cruelty being valued over a, a goodness and a paternalistic attitude. It's not about evil or deceit being valued over being honest, sincere, authentic, caring. No, it's all about the match between those qualities and the contexts. So Machiavelli doesn't really encourage one behavior over the other, evil over goodness, etc. If you get that impression, as I said before, it's simply because more often than not, the nature of the crisis 
the nature of the critical issues that he brings to the table within his examples require that kind of match, require evil to be the most practicable, practicable, most efficacious, most expeditious solution within the space and time, within the confines, the boundaries of those contexts. Not that they're good universally all the time. So this idea that you need a combination of opposites in some way is philosophically in tune with Machiavelli and that marks also the failure, the demise of some leaders. That is to say, the idea that it's part of human nature to tend to rely over and over again on the same kind of behaviors. And once you identify your personality with a certain quality or a certain asset, psychological asset, a psychological strength, you tend to lean on it even to your detriment, even when repeating that kind of behavior will not get you the same kind of result because the context has changed and now the quality that you have as your strongest suit for your leadership is a mismatch to the context. And it would be nice in Machiavellian, in a Machiavellian framework if you could switch and be the opposite to match correctly the kind of problem that you have in front of you or the kind of goal that you're trying to achieve. And this idea that there are apparent contradictions that in, in fact work in your favor is somewhat Machiavellian. Certainly it would be useful to compare it to passages in The Prince such as the ones that I mentioned uh, before, which might be chapter 15, but I, I, I don't know the print, it's not my Bible, so I cannot quote print uh, chapter and verse uh, always accurately, okay? Weakness comes from believing that you can be both a lover and a fighter. If you think about the Machiavellian system, you need to be both a lover and a fighter, meaning that you need to be able to use, well, both force and influence, okay? And you can lean just on one of those two aspects of power, direct and indirect power, right? You have to take care of your public image. You need to be loved, supported, and confided upon by your citizens, but at the same time, you need to be able to switch to the threat of the use of force, deterrence, or the direct use of force in order to maintain your authority over a state, okay? Great warriors understand that fierce is the ally of loving, confrontation is a ally of peace, bravely is the ally of vulnerability, all these things are somewhat aligned. We're not talking about the same thing, but they're somewhat aligned with the general philosophy of power in The Prince. And that makes this book, uh, a, a, in, in some ways, a smart interpretation of Machiavelli, okay? Whether there is a, a clear awareness of what the Machiavellian system is not, or simply the result of the intuition of a smart reader who gets the book, even though uh, uh, she may not um, have a systematic understanding of, of this book, but she gets it. And of course, our attention is drawn by passages that mention Machiavelli in a direct way, such as this one, right? I have, to, I have come to this understanding through two avenues. One is Machiavelli himself, the old courtier. Now, it's kind of a stretch to define Machiavelli as a courtier because he never really frequented habitually, regularly, the court of the Medici. For one thing, a big chunk of his life was spent uh, in a state of, the state of Florence 
that was a republic until the Medicis came back in 1512. And then even after he was readmitted uh, into the circle of the Medici from 15, 1520 on, and he could come out of retirement, come out of his confinement in uh, uh, Sant'Andrea in Percussina, in the countryside of Florence, he was not their consigliore. He was not there in attendance. He uh, was invited to some events. He got their ears some of the time, but uh, I would not call him a courtier, meaning someone who's uh, uh, always in the vicinity, constantly in the proximity of the royal family. The original Kissinger, of course, Kissinger is always considered uh, Machiavellian. Kissinger got it. Kissinger talked about the possibility of a big crisis coming out of Ukraine uh, as far back as 2014, and other people close to him, like John Mirschmeyer, did the same in, in 2015, admitted that he wrote the prince, now this is interesting, uh, about men. For men, to men, and about men. Not woman, but man is the wolf uh, to the man, not women, but man, it one another. And this is a reference to a famous Latin motto, uh, a Latin saying that says, homo homini lupus. Man is the wolf, to another man, meaning men are aggressive to other men. Now, is this really reflective of Machiavelli's view of humankind? To, to a degree, uh, yes, Machiavelli would probably agree that what he recommends in The Prince is mostly for men, that he envisioned mostly a male leadership, although he has some example of female leadership, and one of them, Caterina Sforza Riario, is one of the most powerful examples of leadership. It's the situation of a woman who inherits the control of the city of Forlì in the Italian Northeast. The city uh, is uh, uh, under siege. Uh, the uh, uh, sons of uh, the two sons of Caterina are taken hostage by the enemy, and the enemy shows these poor hostages under the walls of the city to signify you have to open the gates or we'll kill these young men in front of you. Right? What what else can you do? And according to Machiavelli, and Machiavelli. In, in some ways, it's like Robert Greene. He likes to exaggerate the examples. He likes to twist the examples to fit his ideology. But according to the story as it is presented by uh, Machiavelli, Caterina has this, uh, in a way, this masculine display of bravery. She lifted her ground, shows her genitalia, symbolically conveying the idea, kill them, I can make more. Okay, so wow. Machiavelli does not really envision the female gender as the weaker gender that is not made for leadership. But outside of that, there is a, a limited understanding of uh, the Machiavellian idea of leadership. And again, leadership, according to Machiavelli, the control of power goes through two channels, force and influence. And of course, Machiavelli recognizes that force, in a way, belongs, if you want to use this blunt word, to the male gender. However, he also has, not only in The Prince, but through his literature, because he was a literary writer, writer of poems, a writer of plays, and Machiavelli, and even in his letters, even in his private letters, has an acute understanding that the female gender has a special expertise when it comes to influence. And uh, for that, the quickest 
uh, reference would be the novella of Belfagor, and if there is time, we will read it. It's not a very long novella, less than 10 pages, which is entirely based on this idea of the intrinsic, innate power held by women. Women might seem the weaker gender because they lack uh, strength in their muscles, but they're in fact stronger when it comes to influence. And the story, in just a few words, is about the devil holding a council with his minions, and they're wondering the issue on the agenda. The topic on the agenda is, why do we have so, ma so many male customers, right? And fewer female customers. And uh, the answer that is suggested in this council is that it must have something to do with the experience of the average man, and therefore a devil is picked for a mission. This devil's name is Belfagor. They give him funds to establish himself on the earth, and he's supposed to report about this conundrum. What makes more men than women go to hell? So he goes uh, to different places, eventually settles in Florence. He's rich. He has this um, good amount, good stash of funds. He starts a successful commercial enterprise as a merchant, and of course he gets married, right? Because that is the expectation of a member of society. He has to pretend that he's a regular member of society. He gets married to this woman whose name is Onesta, typical medieval name, mean, meaning not really honest. Onesta means honorable, worthy of honor. And he, he, he falls in love with, with this Onesta. Onesta is a terrible woman. Uh, and uh, uh, she doesn't reciprocate this love. She exploits this love to control him. She becomes the lady of the house. The, uh, she wants to manage his company. Uh, she places his, her brother in uh, the, the husband's company. The company is ruined. The, the palace, the, the, this big house they have is ruined because the staff doesn't want to be managed by this nasty woman. And the devil, it's, it gets to be so bad that this devil, Belfagor, has to leave town. Because not only he, he wants to escape from this uh, wife, but also because he has people he owes money to. His, his, it is, he has so many debts that there are people who want to uh, punish him, right? To teach him a lesson and he has to uh, escape, and, and then from there he will find refuge at a farm owned by uh, a farmer entering to a deal, typical of the devil, with the farmer. The farmer says, I will hide you, but in return you'll do me a favor and make me rich. And uh, uh, on and on it goes until what will send Belfagor back to hell, when Belfagor is reneging on his deal with the farmer and refusing to leave the body of the daughter of the King of France that he has possessed, and the farmer is there uh, playing the part of the exorcist, the way the farmer manages to uh, resolve this diabolical possession and send Belfagor back is to announce into his ear to whisper, you, you hear this noise, this commotion outside, your wife is coming back to, to see you. <laughs> and, and he goes back to hell. And the devil, Satan himself, has an understanding that marriage is what sends men to hell, which is Machiavelli's typical, ironic, humorous, somewhat misogynistic uh, uh, approach to this idea that, uh, that women may be weaker physically but they understand influence very well, and therefore they do have a lot of power, even power over men. And you don't really find that reflected in here. It's more of the traditional stereotypes about uh, uh, men and women, right?
And I put a question mark, but there is something interesting in here. When, when she, Harry Rubin writes, Machiavelli's prince had to strike a rigid pose, distant, cunning, destructive. There is some truth to it that in, in many ways the prince is alone, is a tragic, lonely figure who's forced to do evil or to be cunning and destructive, whether he wants it or not, if the situation will require it. And keep in mind that Machiavelli, what's the revolutionary step taken by Machiavelli? To separate politics from morality. That is true. That is what you find in plenty of books. But it's not the whole story. Because Machiavelli is not denying the validity of morality. It's just saying the political game is such that if you want to win within that game, you sometimes have to play not by the rules, right? Because there might be no other way of winning. However, once you step out of politics, and Machiavelli is not like uh, the, the Marxist uh, philosophers of the 20th century, politics is everything. No. Ma for Machiavelli, once you step out of the context of politics, then morality has value in society, right? Because society is not just about politics. And therefore, what is tragic about the prince is that even when the evil prince has saved the day, has done something evil for the sake of the independence, freedom of their community, he can still be judged as immoral and dishonest. He can still go to hell in one way or the other. If you believe in hell, of course, he'll burn in hell. If you don't believe in hell, still posterity will render a very harsh judgment of this kind of leader, regardless of their achievements. So this is all present in Machiavelli. Morality is not necessarily relevant in the, in the political game, not necessarily because there might be exceptions even to this. But politics is just one subset of the life experience and therefore, one way or the other, the prince will be subject to a moral judgment, which is legitimate, doesn't affect the political game, but is legitimate and is done all the time. Um, and I believe I introduced the reference to a dream by uh, Machiavelli, but I don't think I ever described this dream. So about 20 years later, about 1545, uh, uh, Machiavelli has been dead since 1527. One of his friends tells the story that one day he was by Machiavelli's bed. He was already in bed and, and sick. Eventually he would die and he's asleep. Machiavelli wakes up and tells him what he was dreaming about. And again, this could be uh, completely invented, right? But it's interesting because it applies very well to uh, Machiavelli and his system. He tells this friend, I think it was Benedetto Vacchi, but I'm not sure it's not relevant, uh, that in the dream, he was in the afterlife. And he saw two groups of people walking in different directions. One group was poor people with torn clothes, dressed in rags, the other was elegant people, uh, lords, uh, aristocrats, wealthy merchants. And he, in this vision, he asks where he is, where these people are going, who are they? And, and he's being told that the group uh, dressed in rags is the poor, and they're walking uh, on their way to heaven. And the others, those dressed elegantly, who are the aristocrats, the lords, the wealthy merchants, are going to hell. And Machiavelli in the dream states, oh, well, I'd rather join the, uh, those who are going to hell. Hmm. Right? Meaning that he's aware that there is a moral, another side to his system, that there is a moral point of view that can and will be rendered, right, about his apparent advocacy of evil, which is based on pragmatism, not based on the defense of evil or the attribution of value to any kind of evil behavior. But in its usual humorous way, the resolution to the story of the dream is, uh, I'd rather enjoy the conversation with those people 
because those people are interesting. Those people who are full of contradictions, who were powerful and of course did a lot of uh, things that were wrong as well. So there is this idea of the prince as, as, as a lonely figure. He had to be one thing to all people. A princess has, an assess, has of necessity a different agenda. She needs to disrupt the status quo, rearrange people's perception, thereby gain what is rightfully hers. Actually, even the second part is very Machiavellian, right? This kind of gain to rearrange people's perception, to have the people think that you're good even if you're not good, that you care for them even if you only care for the outcome, etc., etc., And she cannot be the princess, a simple, single-minded warrior. She must be the lover and the fighter. We are back into a very Machiavellian framework, this idea that you use force, fighting, you use influence, love, right? Very Machiavellian. And not being single-minded? Of course not, because you have to change and adapt to the changing circumstances. And if you just continue to repeat the same kind of behavior, then you're destined to fail sooner or later, sooner rather than later. This is the passage where you find the anticipation of something that will be developed in the rest of the book. What are the alternatives to force, the more peaceful alternatives? One is called besting. So it's something that you find in a lot of self-help books. Uh, written after that, I'm, I'm not implying that she's imitational. In fact, she's leading the way in this kind of proposition, but then it becomes very common during the, the 2000s and the 2010s, this idea that in order to win, in order to have a successful career in your work environment, you need to have such strong qualities, your qualities, the qualities you develop, the professional qualities have to be so exceptional that no one can deny you a promotion. Because it's so clear, it's so evident that you are extraordinarily gifted, that you are so much better than you uh, need to uh, go away. And then you find later on, maybe not here, but later on, the reference to enabling your enemies, being a leader by enabling others to succeed. This way you become indispensable. A bit contradictory, but that, that's how, and, and again, you find a lot of literature about this kind of literature, uh, about this kind of concept. I like the references to the rules you find throughout this chapter. Uh, there is only a partial understanding of what is Machiavellian about this, changing the game, changing the rules, or taking advantage of a crisis because during a crisis all the rules are forgotten or uh, some of the rules do not apply any longer. What is Machiavellian about this in a slightly different sense? The idea that a Machiavellian game, a typical game of power, is hard to play at the individual level in the lowest levels of society because individuals at lower level in society have no control over the game, right? The most trivial example would be a criminal who can gain a lot of power within the situation, the limited context of a robbery. You enter a bank, the context is closed, right? There are walls, people cannot go out. Of course, you control the entrance, hopefully, and, and you have guns, you may have accomplices, complete control, but you have no control over the rules of the social game. So if you come out of the bank with $100,000 and you find the police outside, then of course you'll be arrested. Of course you'll go to jail. You have no control over those games. And that's why, on the other hand, organize, criminal organizations such as the Mafia are so successful because they are not confined to the lowest level of criminality. But the same way you've seen in The Godfather Part 1, they climb the social scale and develop connections with the police, the judges, the press, the government in the most outrageous uh, situations, right? And this way, you see, for example, John Gotti, who was really an animal, uh, for example, he bit several people because he, he was prone to anger, uh, 
he probably had a neighbor uh, killed uh, because of the tragic circumstances. The neighbor accidentally killed his son backing up his car and uh, was, was innocent. It was just a tragic accident. Uh, but when John Gotti was taken to trial, at least twice, because of, of a beating, and he didn't need really to beat someone up, being such a leader of his organization, he always went out free. He, he was always acquitted because, of course, in one instance, he bribed or threatened the jury. In other instance, he probably got to the judge, right? This is real proximity to the rules of the game. I can do a crime, but I don't do the time because I can modify for me the rules of the game because I can rig the judicial system. I can bribe the police to destroy evidence. I can threaten an eyewitness, etc., etc. This means to be able to modify the rules of the game, right? The same way that you, as a student, might think that it should be Machiavellian to plagiarize your paper from the internet, but it's not because you don't control the rules of the game, right? Because if the professor uh, uh, finds out, how do you control the professor? How do you control the academic judiciary? You cannot influence the outcome by changing the rules. And therefore, you become part of the system, you're, you're subject to the power of the system. So there is some that is something that is interesting in here, but it's only a partial understanding. Or as I said, it might be a, a powerful intuition, right? People uh, who, who can read a, a creative text and, and have some understanding without making this into a comprehensive uh, ideology. She's true princess and a prince comes from taking the first place. Princep uh, uh, is a, a Latin word that uh, was used uh, at the end of the Republic to indicate the first emperor who didn't take the title of imperator and take this title of princeps, meaning the first among peers. A leader who recognizes the relevance of the surrounding community of aristocrats and wealthy Romans, of course, we're talking still about a society of the elites, about a democracy republic of the elites. The, the empire is just a, a republic with uh, some changes uh, that are going on, but it'll take 300 years for the Roman state to become a true empire or a Star Wars-like empire, okay? And yeah, principessa is the Italian word uh, for, for that. They don't derive from principles. They're associated. They have the same etymological base. Okay? Machiavelli believed a good man doesn't, hasn't got a chance. He comes to ruin among the many who are not good. This is true. Machiavelli was very pessimistic. And therefore, again, it looks like Machiavelli advocated for evil because he liked it. But one of the reasons why so often Machiavelli recommends that evil may be the solution is exactly this kind of pessimism about humankind, that you cannot play by the rules if others uh, who have as strong a desire to succeed as you will not play by the rules in that uh, context. But again, it's kind of a limited understanding of Machiavellian system, the Machiavellian system, because Machiavelli himself also believed, and you find that in The Prince, that good leadership could make good, good and honest citizens out of this canine, this mob, this populace. Because, as I said many times at this point, Machiavelli, Machiavelli believed that if you are forced to abide by the rules, because you have a leadership in your community that scares you into compliance, sooner or later, going by the rules will become a habit for you. And whether you want to or not, you'll become naturally honest as second nature, 
but naturally honest. Machiavelli also believed that a princedom is only one of the formats for the political organization of society and never the point of arrival. That societies go through a cycle of changes from anarchy, that would be the, the, also the state of uh, primitive society, kind of Hobbesian state, from anarchy to tyranny, and the prince would be a tyrant with absolute power, and from tyranny to an oligarchy or an aristocracy, from an aristocracy to a republic. And Machiavelli clearly saw the republic as the best format, but one that realized, or in order to be successful, relies on the honesty of the citizens. So he also believed that once you trained your citizens to be more mature, more responsible, then you can get rid of the tyrant who installed those boundaries and enforced the boundaries, forcing people to be, to be honest. So Machiavelli thinks that his time is a time of anarchy, more or less. It's a time where people, uh, people's uh, uh, worst instinct, instincts are not kept in check but that there is the possibility of an evolution, a future evolution, where uh, citizens can be more responsible and therefore a tyranny would not be a good match for their mindset and a republic could be sustainable within those circumstances. So again, it's a gross, gross simplification to just say that Machiavelli advocated for evil, recommended duplicity, deceit, uh, etc. It's almost time for me to stop. Let me see what I can po propose to you before we switch. This is the same as we found before, right? Lover, fighter means influence, force, And another brief at the end of page 11 in the book, another interesting reference to the rules. Women are not successful because they feel they must play by the rules. And of course, uh, by, by Machiavellian standards, then uh, you, you need to be able to change the rules in your favor or disregard the rules. And then you find law number one, which of course should have been law number two. Uh, from the earliest days, they mark themselves as different from others. This is the princessa, the model of success, of course. Yeah, the, this, this is uh, Machiavellian, right? Uh, uh, the idea that the leader is different from the masses, right? That leadership is confined to a select group of individuals who have certain skills to offer. They never consider themselves brave. Uh, it's, it's not exactly... Machiavellian. They treat destiny as their mentor is another controversial point where you can find, if you look at the development of this concept in the next paragraphs, you find some of Machiavelli's uh, ideology, but it's not exactly played uh, the same way. What can be found that is Machiavellian is the underlying idea that in order to be successful, you need to find a match between your skills and the context in which you grew up and the context in which you try, attempt to become a leader. So destiny is important, right? So Machiavelli will tell you it was necessary for Moses to find the Jewish people enslaved because that is the kind of skills, the set of skills, that he had to offer to the Jews. I can take you out of Egypt and into the Holy Land. I can be that kind of leader. If he had been born to a peaceful Jewish community, then his destiny would not have been fulfilled because the skills would not have been in demand in that kind of situation. And as you found in Green, there is a lot of talking in here and the rest of the book about emotions 
and whether or not you need to control your emotions. Of course, according to Machiavelli, you need to control your emotions. And this is a limit for Machiavelli, clearly. Machiavelli is pre-Freud. Machiavelli has no notion of the subconscious. He has this naive Renaissance belief that you can actually control even the most powerful emotions, for example, those associated with violence, that you can switch from being a, a, a tranquil leader to being a bloody uh, uh, monster killing your enemy and then go back to normal without suffering these psychological consequences. But, and it's interesting that all of these things are being discussed in mm, these books. And I like this passage about women are the fiercer sex because all the tradition that is mentioned here is really powerful cultural tradition that in some ways has been forgotten. Uh, these Greek myths and uh, dramas and tragedies where you see a woman as the most powerful hero in the story, but especially in association with the theme of revenge. And it's, it's interesting that in here she says, well, women don't uh, succeed because in their professional lives use one set of strategies, but in their personal affairs they, they uh, relinquish those uh, instruments of success. And in a way, it was the same for Machiavelli. Machiavelli was not Machiavellian in his own life. And uh, he, he was not as successful as he might have been, right? So this is true for him as well. It is very Machiavellian to emphasize action. Machiavelli, in the end, uh, at the end of The Prince will tell you, feel free to disregard everything, in the end, even if you commit mistakes, it is better to act than to spend too much time reflecting. There's this understanding that time is of the essence, and at the end of the prince, he has the Italian crisis in, in mind, meaning you may not be able to find the perfect Machiavellian solution to this crisis, but there is only one time when this crisis can be resolved, which is now. So given this limit, you have to try a practical solution, practicable solution, even if you know it is not perfect. Acting is better than uh, waiting. Okay, so this uh, ideologically is, is Machiavellian, right? To the point where Machiavelli at, this, at the end will just say, it is better to be impetuous, right? Instead, instead of being reflective, because he's, he's a man of his time. And you have the final proclamation that you can read. Uh, why fight like Machiavelli when you can fight like Machiavella? It's time you govern in your life the way princes have governed their kingdoms. Your author in her nom de guerre of uh, Machiavella. Okay? It's, it's an enjoyable book. Um, you don't necessarily have to agree with the books um, that you, you, you study, but certainly it's one that is makes for uh, a somewhat enjoyable reading. So this is the page that I'll introduce now and then I'll continue another time. It is your set of guidelines for the paper with plenty of examples and it starts with a key section. Your paper has to be based on a book that is already Machiavellian in explicit explicit ways. So you find here a list of possible choices. It's not a closed set. There may be others that I completely ignore. Uh, but in here you find some of the better choices and otherwise let me know if you would like to write your paper on a different book. You just have to talk to me after the class or send me an email with the title of the book explaining in just a few lines why you think that book might work very well. Even though the list is about 20 titles long, yeah, 17 at this point, there are some books that work much, much better than others, right? 
So, for example, the laws of power or the princessa are easier to work with and are written better. The new prints, to a degree, but it, it's full of relevant information, but less easy to work with because in the end what you have to do is compare and contrast these books, their contents, with Machiavelli and say, is this passage, this example, this law that I read in this book, Machiavellian, to what degree, and this is what I find in this book, this is what I found in Machiavelli, if there is a specific passage to quote. What would Machiavelli do being our first reading is also easy to work with. It's somewhat rudimentary and a bit boring in that regard, but certainly easy to work with, not as interesting as the other uh, books. The boss is somewhat interesting, but again, it depends on your own interest. My view of these books may not match uh, what you expect uh, to learn from this, because you should take this as an opportunity to learn something, not just to do something uh, for me. Now, The Family is about a Borgias. Uh, it's uh, the last book by Mario Puzo with uh, heavy intervention by uh, his uh, friend, Carol Gino. Not his best book, but you can work with it. It's slightly harder to work with, uh, but you can find good material. The Suit is the book that I chose for my example of uh, and, and explanation of a template. Let me circulate the attendance in the meantime. Forgot to do it earlier. Okay. It, it's kind of a parody of the prince. Uh, it's a divertissement by an intellectual. So it's smartly written, but has nothing to offer other than this humorous parody of the prince in reference to dressing up properly for power. The Machiavelli Covenant is a very long book. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to read if you, if you like books. Uh, about conspiracies, uh, murder, uh, etc. Uh, and there are references to uh, Machiavelli. The, the idea behind the book is interesting, uh, that you have this circle of powerful conspirators, powerful players working together in order to strengthen their loyalty to one another. They force every member for their initiation to commit a murder for which the organization keeps the evidence. So no one can betray the organization without ruining themselves, and, they're, and therefore they're fully committed to the goals of the organization. Minas Jones, The Modern Prince, you can work with it, and he re-edited in 2020. It's kind of a simple book, not very interesting. The new Machiavelli, you can work with it, it's, more, it's intelligent as, as a book, but not too interesting. Uh, number 11, Machiavelli for Moms, is another very good example because it's a humorous uh, set of suggestions. Mothers, be Machiavellians with your husbands and children, and you'll be happier. And it's done well. Uh, it, it's well written has interesting references to Machiavelli, and although it's humorous, it's really on, really on target, okay? So it is higher on my list of suggestions. Let me go uh, quickly. Modern Machiavelli, I've included it because, of course, the references are there, but I would leave it alone. Uh, same with psychological warfare and deception. Yeah. Or, or number 16, Dark Psychology. Number 17 I just added, but I haven't read it yet, so I have no uh, suggestions for now. The following section tells you what the structure of the paper should be. It doesn't have to be this way, but this is a good template for this kind of work. So unless you have a strong background in English and the humanities, and you have a better template in mind, 
you should follow this. But I'll stop because it's 10.10 uh, and it's time. I'll see you on Friday. And of course, we'll continue with this uh, the week after the Spring Bake Friday will be devoted mostly to the film, okay?